You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Hello, Stella. Hi, Sasha. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. As you may remember, we did an episode on queer theory uh, several months back, and we had a lot of listeners engage with us in the comments, and people were really interested in the topic and encouraged us to bring somebody on who's really an expert in this subject. So we have a guest today, don't we? Yes. And I first had the pleasure of meeting Heather Brunskill-Evans when I did my film Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk. And at the time, I was fairly intimidated by Heather because she just knew so much more than I knew. And I was like, oh, oh, because I was right at that time. I was I would argue I really didn't. I know a lot lot more about gender now than I did then. You know, I'd had my experience as a kid, but I really didn't know the stuff. And oh, my God, that day talking in a park with Heather was was it was fabulous. It was fascinating and it was fabulous and enlightening. So. This this conversation should be equally enlightening because we're really going to get into it, I think. I think we're really going to get into the philosophical underpinnings, maybe, of what, how we got here, how we got to this place where we're all kind of looking at each other going, what is going on? What Whatever happened? And I think, if I'm right, Heather, you were there at the beginning and have seen the entire gender phenomenon unfold. Is that right? Oh, that's true. Um, I'm I'm not sure whether I'm I'm happy about how this ages me, but anyway, the re- the truth <laughs> is, yes, I have been there from the beginning of it. Yeah, definitely. I I did a PhD on queer theory in the uh, early 1990s. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was quite a while ago, and I imagine. Queer theory has probably changed and evolved and taken on many iterations since you were studying it. That was the beginning of queer theory, really, wasn't it? The early nineties. It was. Yeah. Um, and there were ways in which you couldn't talk about certain things then, as well as now. But they've shifted and changed. But there's a connection. If I try and explain that a bit, before before you do, Heather, do you mind just sharing with our audience if there are listeners who are not familiar with you? Can you just share a little bit about you know who are you? What's your academic background? What's your professional background? Just to ground us in some context. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So um, I'm actually a philosopher, but a strange mixture of being a philosopher and a sociologist at the same time, because my area of expertise is um, how we place medicine in a social context. So, of course, the idea of uh, medical practice is infused with philosophical ideas about how we know things, who we are, and so on and so forth. So, um, So the relationship between medicine and culture as a philosopher, has has been my area. And of course, without, um, as we know now, gender identity has taken centre stage. So I can trace back from now, back to when I first started to study this in the 1990s. But to keep your, uh, to make sure that your readers know where I am now, I became very interested in the medical transgendering of children in the year 2006. 16 to 17 and my life has never ever been the same since I have to tell you um, but to go back to how I ended up in that position is perhaps what might be interesting for for listeners to hear about so I'll do a little Absolutely. synopsis if that's okay but please do sure. ask me questions um, because I can the difficulty with this is that it is so philosophically based that I can go into that because partly that is very important and at the same time it can lose a listener's interests, quite understandably so. So stop me at the point that I start 
rambling on about too much about it. All right, we will. Good. I'm so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it all right. began in the early 1990s. <laughs> so it all began in the early 1990s when I had actually done an, a master's degree before I did the PhD. And um, I was very concerned. I didn't like the work that I, as, I, as I understood it of Michel Foucault. So I was I wanted to do a PhD on the relationship between how we think about child sexual abuse from a radical feminist point of view and a Foucauldian point of view. So that was how I started with this idea that radical feminism was just going to demolish Foucault. That's what I wanted it to do. Now, um just to backtrack a little bit, when I told people I was doing a PhD on child sexual abuse, everybody was, you know, people were fascinated by it because at that particular time there was a lot or it was almost the first time that the prevalence of child sexual abuse was was reaching some pro prominence because before then it had thought to be, you know, a minor thing hardly in anybody's experiences. And, of course, women were telling me, how much sexual abuse they had in their childhood. So a, constellations of, a constellation of things came together. But when people asked me about what I was doing, I hated talking about it because, in fact, everybody wanted to say, oh, yes, it's, it's awful, it's terrible, there's so much of it about now and we didn't know about it. These things were true. But it was very difficult for me to explain I was, what my PhD was about was about knowledge it was about how we think about these things and how we how how we think gets connected up with ethics and politics so it was quite um it was quite an intellectual phd rather than empirical 75% of people have this and da 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 it it really wasn't like that and um so so that was me so it hung around a little incident in the History of Sexuality, Volume 1, where Foucault talks about an incident. I don't know whether you, uh, some listeners may, may know it. Um, an incident of a little girl in a, a bucolic event where basically this child um, masturbates um, a, a simple um what we would think of as a sort of um, slightly mentally deficient man who couldn't special have sex. Needs. A special needs, that's the correct term. A special needs person um, who, who, you know, an adult woman wouldn't have sexual relationships with him. And Foucault makes this sound completely innocuous and unproblematic. And, and it was only in the 19th century that we began to um, think of adult child sex as problematic. Well, of course, I found that ab absolutely outrageous. So just to, to make sure our listeners are following, an adult man with an intellectual disability sexually abuses a female child. And Foucault initially framed this as not being problematic, just being a uh, kind of a circumstance that happens in that kind of environment in these types of psychological uh, situations. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, other than that you've used a term now, which is a, a, a man was sexually abusing a child. Mm. The point of Foucault writing it was to say that we now think of this as somebody sexually abusing a child. But in fact, that category of sexual abuse, that pathologization of the man, that moral judgment that we've made about it was new. That's the point that he was trying to make. Now, that I found that uh, persuasive and difficult, both at the same time. So I set out to analyze something that I thought was both true and untrue, because I can quite see that we use categories now as if they're innocent, as if they're as 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 um, as 
real or not socially contingent as the oxygen that we breathe because we're so familiar with the terms. But Foucault's, the whole point of Foucault is to problematize the common sense, to problematize the way we think about things. I'd like to just interject for a second because yes. this is kind of, this is very difficult because yeah. we, we certainly, I mean, I think Stella and I both launched into this work in the first place because we do believe in this fundamental right of adults to protect children. And what I'm thinking about is the way we discuss something like human rights. So, for example, the right to water, you know, I think for most people in developed nations, this seems very fundamental. But if we think big picture about humanity existing on the planet, there's no such thing as the right to water. You know, human beings had to walk for miles and miles and miles and risk dying to get water, you know? So it's, it's kind of like, I think what you're talking about is the way we have in our current conception of things, applied certain categories and labels to human behaviors or human experiences that in another time frame may not have been understood that way. Does that seem like an accurate connection? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. And of course, the whole thing of rights is a social construct anyway. Um, none of us have any rights to anything. Yeah, it's also of its time, like our morality, like our morality now compared to our morality 30 years ago compared to it 100 years ago. It's so shaped and we think that we have it just right, Goldilocks right, right now, every single time. We we never really do. It reminds me, do you remember um, Scott in the Antarctic? And he, he reached the pole, he reached the South Pole and he was considered a hero. And Shackleton didn't reach the pole but he kept all his men alive and he didn't get such heroic status. Mm, hundred years mm. later, Shackleton is the hero and Scott is old news because, and there's a classic example of it. It changes depending on our time. Mm. And what is interesting is um, whilst it hasn't changed, if you say something, if one says something which jars against the, general perception then so much aggression is directed to us um until the tipping point and when we when such a thing then becomes thinkable but if i can go back i would hate your listeners to think that i think that there's nothing problematic about adult child sex i absolutely do what what i found compelling about this incident was that Foucault is both right and wrong because his whole um, his whole oeuvre, his whole point of writing is to demonstrate that there is always power operative in every social relationship. But with this particular incident, he wanted to say that there wasn't a power relationship involved. So I wanted to turn it back on him and say, yes, we think differently about sex. Um, in different historical periods, obviously we live our sex differently in different historical periods, but we always have to place this into the context of the, of the larger power relationships that are going on. So I felt like I caught Foucault out as being a man, as it were, in that incident <laughs> that he didn't identify with being a woman, being a female, being a girl child, that he had thought that uh, that uh, a man with special needs who couldn't, who nobody, no adult woman would have sex with, he actually paid her some money to do that, to, to that little girl. We know nothing about her social background. We know nothing about what she felt about him. She may have been revolted and repulsed. We don't know. So... So the the incident, as it were, in this book, The History of Sexuality, which I think is an astonishing book and I advise anybody to read it, it the, the astonishing thing about that little incident was that I could make so much out of it. I could make a PhD thesis out of it, were, as it were, by analysing it, what Foucault was doing with it, how radical feminists would interpret him as just, you know, Foucault as just advocating what we think of as child sexual abuse and turning Foucault into a demon, which is what 
has happened, in fact. So that's how I started on this journey. And could you tell me about the PhD in queer theory? How did that work out? Well, at the time, um, queer theory, again, sorry, this is probably going to be a bit boring, but, you know, Queer, what we think of as queer theory now wasn't queer theory then. Firstly, it's so reductionist now what we think of it. But, you know, Foucault never called himself a queer theorist, nor did he call himself a postmodernist. In fact, he didn't like the term postmodernism and disagreed that he's a postmodernist. He would call her, he called himself a post-structuralist, which I probably best not get into, but um, just, <laughs> I'll have to for 30 seconds, broadly, that was to, um, the post-structuralism was a particular philosophical movement which undermined the idea that we're liberal, independent agents of our own lives. It was basically, and there were many philosophers part of it, each with their own angle on it, was that we're, we're a product of the culture in which we live rather than an agent of the culture in which we live. And, of course, that's very threatening to the ego. So that in itself people were finding problematic. None of that has been brought into queer theory as we have it right now because it's anti-identity. It's saying that if we have a strong sense of identity, it's because that identity has been constructed for us and we ident we we believe it to be the case but actually if you could take it apart if you deconstruct it you can see how identities are formed at different historical periods and cultural contexts but when you're feeling it you feel that they're utterly authentic and genuine so this is so far removed from the queer theory which says well the transgender informed queer theory that identity is inherent. It's so anti um, Foucault and, and actually anti all the other post-structuralist thinkers. So when queer theory first began, there was this idea that, you know, if we experience ourselves to be, you know, female, heterosexual, or whatever the norms of society are, it was let us unpick that and see how it is that we arrived at that and how we perceive those identities to be the, the core of who we are, when in fact they have been given to us as norms, which we then find quite difficult. So it was, a, it was a, as far as I was concerned, it was a humanitarian uh, move. It was, to, it was about freedom. It was about suggesting that we're constrained by these norms. I think I heard you, you know, the podcast that you're talking about, Stella, where you were saying that although you experience yourself as heterosexual, you know that your sexuality, um, or all of our sexualities, I would say, isn't fixed in that way. It's much more blurred. That, that we, we're brought up to think that you're either heterosexual or homosexual. And probably none of us fit into that those categories neatly. But people, many people would find that threatening to think in that way. So at the beginning, it was a way to think through those issues. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I completely agree with you that it is blurred and it is threatening to say it's blurred. And it almost feels radical, even in 2021, to say, ah, uh, you know, I, mm. I'm I'm more complicated than that, and there's 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 a there's a wideness and a richness to my sexual attraction that is is uh, doesn't feel comfortable walking into a certain category and staying in it and saying that's mm. me done and dusted. And God bless the people who are very comfortable in it, but I'm not. I'm not comfortable in that category, and it just doesn't sing to me. Mm. I think what what's coming up for me is that there's a type of kind of parsimony that we're able to achieve when we have some kind of clear demarcation in categories. And by uh, kind of examining whether or not our concepts of 
norms were given to us by the culture, it almost leaves a, a bit of a, an abyss beneath your feet in a way, because then all yeah. of a sudden you start to question everything, you know, like why are any of the choices I've made coming my way? Is everything imposed on me by a culture and a set of kind of schema that we have around us? And so that's, I do, I still stand by my idea that there's something destabilizing about that, perhaps also freeing if you're able to move through that exploration in a way that creates meaning and and you can construct a new sense of the world, but it is destabilizing in that it, it kind of removes the kind of bumper lanes that we use to navigate life. If all of a sudden we say, actually, we can question all of this and where did this come from and why do we feel these ways and why do we have these categories? Yeah, I, I agree. And I also think that when, when you're feeling insecure and uneasy about life, we tend to just naturally and instinctively go back to, you know, who we are, where we're from, all the grounding kind of categories mm-hmm. that kind of bring ground us and relax us and stabilize us. We do that mm-hmm. because feeling that we can't categorize feels, like you say, unstable. It feels it's unnerving. But this is where we have to examine where queer theory has got us now. If I could just return uh, briefly, mm-hmm. the, the, the point of this, the point of this deconstructing wasn't to deconstruct everything. It was to try to to explore how it is when in li- it was about, it was a philosophical theory in many ways about liberal democracy, that in liberal democracy, it's easy for us to imagine that we're free. And it was a, it was a way of tr- it providing a lens through which we could look at the ways in which we're unfree, almost at the point, the very point at which we think that we're most free. So Foucault would talk about, you know, we're, we're obsessed with sexuality. So he wasn't pro um, um, this idea that we could become sexually liberated. His whole thesis in A History of Sexuality, Volume 1, the very book I'm talking about, is that we're obsessed with it. We're tied into it. We imprison ourselves with thinking that sexuality is going to free us. So that that um that the point of his writing was not to deconstruct everything so that we didn't have any ground to stand on it was to deconstruct things so that the ground that we stood on was even stronger that we are as agents as conscious agents we could reflect upon ourselves now that now has just taken off so that all we ever do is is I think a very negative thing that queer theory has got into, which is to is to almost pull everything down as being bad, wrong, normative. Yeah. The only thing it never pulls down is is the the alleged, you know, minority of people for who for whom they're saying we have rights, our rights are not being are not being met, and there is no self reflection. <laughs> they've edited out self-reflection it's just everybody else who has to reflect so it's it's um i think it's become a really negative movement now i'd like to go back and tell you what it was that i couldn't say at that period of time okay yeah in the 90s you're talking about in the 90s Heather? in the okay. 90s okay so just as now if you open your mouth and say something you know, innocuous to what sounds to me innocuous, like what J.K. Rowling said, as far as I'm concerned, it was a very loving article, will be completely demonized as if you're a complete hateful bigot. Well, what you couldn't say in the 1990s and had a similar, uh, a similar feeling to it, similar dynamics, and I think I can trace the trajectory through from that, is you wow. couldn't talk about women's bodies. That was regarded as biologically essentialist. So I fell into a tra- I fell into the same kind of dynamics in a peculiar kind of way doing the PhD as I have now, which is um, the, the woman's body can't be talked about. So that began right then. 
that began all of those years ago. So yeah. what do you mean, though, that the woman's body couldn't be talked about? Are you saying couldn't be contrasted against a man's body? Or are you saying, you know, for example, like talking about women's reproductive health or talking about, because I know you studied the way medicine and culture interact. So when you say we couldn't talk about women's bodies in the 90s, can you share some examples of what that means? Yeah, I will. For example, I wanted to then say about this little girl in this incident that she was a female person, that she would have had experiences as a female person uh, that, that were important. And those kinds of discussions were erased. Now, it, it, it's it, uh, when I say erased, what I mean is if, if I was in a seminar, for example, trying to talk about this, the accusation would come back to me that I was being biologically essentialist. So I'll have to explain what that term means. Just as the, just as the accusation now comes back, if you say anything, that you're being transphobic. It was the same kind of thing, like you can't think that and you can't say it. Because if you think it and if you say it, you're being retrograde. You're not quite understanding how sophisticated everybody else is. So that accusation of being biologically essentialist was an insult to some, to a theorist. It was as if to say, oh, you think everything's to do with the biology and you don't really realize that biology is just a social construct. That was happening then. And it came about for the following reasons, I think. That because women have always been, you know, it came about from the feminine, it started with the feminist movement, I think, in the 1970s and 80s. And it started with a good thing. It started with women wanting to say that um, they did not want to be tied to their biology, that being tied to their biology was a sort of, was, I mean, theoretically and symbolically and through language. That was the way in which women were oppressed. So, you know, women were allegedly couldn't um, do science in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th wow. century because apparently their ovaries or their uteruses would mean that they couldn't possibly think. And so the, ex- the reasons why patriarchy, in a sense, was mobilized through the idea that women were defective men. They were sort of like men. But what, what, what meant that they were, weren't as capable as men was that it was because of they had pathological bodies or they were reproductive, wow. they had babies and so on. So obviously the thing to do then was to have a form of analysis in which sex and gender were separated from each other. So this uh-huh. separation uh-huh. of sex and gender was happening then. And that, that separated out our, our performance of gender, I agree with Judith Butler in many ways about this, it separated out gender as a social construct from biology, and it said there was a rift. Biology did not necessarily lead to the gendered roles in which we live and which we perform. So it was, a, it was, like, it was like queer theory. Um, which is che- which has become gone through different shifts and changes. This separation of sex and gender was initially very good, and then it's gone through various shifts and changes. And the shift it went through was the argument that if you talk about sex at all, you're being retrograde. You're going back in time. Don't talk about it now. Could could I just ask you there, just yeah. to clarify? So just to clarify, if I have it right, so the kind of, from what you're saying is from the 60s to the 80s, I think the feminists were arguing that there was more social construction going on and that we weren't as tied to our biology as as society was telling us. And then it kind of almost went too far insofar as too far east is west. And they kind of almost did away with biology. And it was like by yeah. the 1990s, we weren't allowed to act as if we had any constraints in our, in our biology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Can, can I ask a question too? Mm-hmm. Because I, I mean, well, there's a couple things coming to mind, but I, I don't want to stray too far away. I'm thinking about something very compelling that I've heard feminists talk about. And I think, um, scientists and people in the medical profession talking about, which is that for lots of different 
you know, medical conditions, historically, the data we have has been studied on male bodies. And so I heard this really compelling feminist argument that says, we have to take into consideration that males and females are not the same. And we have to study how does heart disease affect a female person, for example, or a woman? And how does this condition affect a woman? So I, I hear what you're saying, but I also wonder, it seems bizarre to me to think that in the 90s, people were saying, don't talk about biology, because I thought that actually we were trying to talk about biology more in some ways, and talking about women's reproductive health, for example, which seems to have been an issue that gained a lot of attention around that time. So can you help un us understand, are you talking about in, in academic philosophical communities, there was a pushback against talking about women's bodies? Or are you saying even more broadly in society? I'm saying it started off in academia, just as queer theory sort of started off in academia and is now affecting the whole of our culture. So uh -huh. What actually happened was, of course, in the 70s and 80s, uh, women were doing a lot of concrete empirical work on issues of reproductive health um, and so on, um, birth. Yeah, maternity. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, then that became seen as, you know, what the ordinary feminist might do. We then got... You know, our equality laws had 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 come into being. We had, uh, you know, equal pay and so on and so forth. So it seemed that those kinds of issues that that women on the ground had been, or feminists on the ground had been working towards, had had all been done. It had been done by then. Of course, they're still not done now. But at the time, um, in academia, it was as if, well, we move beyond that now. Let's think. Mm -hmm. Let's let's move forward. I think that's often the case in in academia that it starts in academia. We don't even know it's happening, yeah. and then the discourse, you know, maybe ten years later, is saying what academia was was arguing about ten years previously. I think yeah. that that's a fairly common arc. Yeah. And you were there for when it started. Is, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You notice now that the say the argument about biological essentialism is used a lot in queer theory. That you know, if women say, actually, I'd quite like to be called a woman, not a, a uterus bearer, that is apparently biologically essentialist. But um, so that term came from then, and it was a silencing term. I know my, um, j j just to relate an anecdote, I know my own daughter, she's in first year, which is like 13 odd in, in, in Ireland. And there was a whole group chat at lunchtime where the, the, all the kids were chatting in a nice way, but kind of saying, well, if men are the same as women, w why aren't men allowed to hit women? It doesn't seem fair. And my girl said, uh, well, men are stronger than women. And there was a huge pushback. She was the only one who was arguing this, and the rest of the crowd were saying, oh, no, no, you can't say that. Some men are stronger than women. You can't say men are stronger than women. Or some women are stronger than Sorry, men. Sorry, yeah. yeah. And yeah, she yeah. came back to me, kind of scratching her head, saying, am I, I am right, am I right? Men are stronger than women. And I was like, ah. Mm. <laughs> and that is, the, the, the discourse you were hearing in the 1990s has travelled 13-year-olds saying, Absolutely. you can't say men are stronger than women. Absolutely. And this is what's happening in the sports debate, the trans sports debate. There's all of this uh, rhetoric around um, that, you know, some women on the bell curve are stronger than some men. And therefore, you can't actually say that women on average are less strong than men. I mean, this is happening now. It is happening now. And it's indicative, isn't it, that in this alleged equality, we can't even, you know, Stella's daughter can't even suggest that on the whole, men are stronger than women, as if it's an equal opportunity issue. But, you know, as yeah. in all of these things, it's the men who are getting the advantage of all of this critique of biological essentialism. When women's bodies are edited out, it hasn't done what we hoped it would do in the 1980s, which is to free women to be agents uh, 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 the same as men. What has actually happened is it's just opened the door 
for men to take over everything, <laughs> including our bodies, as it were. It's only men now who are allowed to talk about bodies, uh, female bodies, not women. <laughs> That's a brilliant point. How did it evolve mm-hmm. then? So the 1990s, you were studying this, watching this begin. Yeah. And then did you see queer theory change then? Um. Well, at the time, I was quite unhappy about it. I was confused. It couldn't quite get the language right because I wanted to talk about patriarchy and the way that, that somehow everything got turned to men's advantage. And, of course, that term patriarchy was being deconstructed at the same time as being too ill-fashioned. And, uh, you know, there were other theorists coming into it, Derrida and, it's, you know, theories of language and so on. Some of which was quite, um, which was good. I think that there, we can fall into extremes where we think that all men are oppressing all women and we need to deconstruct that. But we, it, we, it seems that we can never have a subtle conversation about, uh, about these things. You know, <clears throat> we have to, we have to be on one side or the other. Yeah, that reminds me of back, way back, probably the 1990s, where you used to hear people scoff at the line, all men are rapists. And that kind of, that was the, when it was getting extremist. And there was kind of, I suppose, a lot of black and white thinking and people scoffing at it. And I know, you know, in a way, feminists got an awful lot of, they always got an awful lot of stick from the general public. But the feminists were these outliers who were, pushing for stuff that really, um, if they could just be good and quiet, we'd all be getting along better. And it's a horribly insidious kind of thought process that has really ruined the feminist moment since like the 19th century. You know, your voices are Mm. shrill. I remember W.B. Yeats saying that about an amazing feminist in Ireland. And and she, she was a beautiful woman, but he basically said she lost her looks and her voice grew shrill. You know, mm. because she became a feminist, yeah, yeah. you know. And so so to move it on, though, because even th- though it's fascinating, I'm I'm very keen to know, as that moved into the 2000s, when did you first notice anything to do with the, the transgender movement impacting? You were there in queer theory, you were there in Foucault, and you were there in feminism. Mm. Mm. When did trans issues first come across your radar? Well, I'm very embarrassed to say that it didn't come across my radar till 2016, but there were women who had uh, recognised the um, seriousness of it. So in in the 1970s even, somebody called Janice Raymond wrote a book called The Transgender Empire, and I think I probably read it, but didn't take much notice of it. So between the time that we're talking about in the 1990s when I was doing a PhD and then 2016, I kind of got out of the world of thinking about queer theory. And I was, you know, earning my living, working and bringing up a family and, and all the rest of it. And then um, an incident happened which changed my life completely. This incident was that um, I was working at the University of Leicester at the time and I, I was on a lunch break and I walked out um, in the, into the high street and there on a newsstand was a, um, an article. It was Vanity Fair magazine and on the front of Vanity Fair was Bruce Jenner dressed as, you know, allegedly transitioning um, in a very provocative pose with a wig on and so on. I don't know whether you know the image at all. Yeah, it's famous. But uh, it was uh, it's fame. It was famous. It's iconic. So um, I was fascinated by it, and actually, I used a, Ju- a Butlerian, a Judith Butler sort of form of analysis of that image, um, and I wrote it. I talked about how femininity is performative. So, in fact, it seemed to the general public, because there was an article inside Vanity Fair too, it seemed that his performance of femininity was more real than actual women's bodies and and, and, and female people. So, I thought that I was making a fairly bog-standard point, which anybody in academia in the world that I was in would comprehend and understand because I'd done those kinds of analyses before but I hadn't done it about transgenderism and it was 
an internal. It was within the university. It was, it was, we shared what we call think pieces with each other. And I literally had no idea that I had done anything provocative apart from a couple of days later, I was contacted by um, the university and told that my piece was had to be taken down and sent to the university's lawyers because they'd had complaints about it. And the complaints were numerous that I'd broken the 2010 Equality Act. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't really know about the 2010 Equality Act, that my students would be petrified to go to, to come to the university because of my presence. And any trans members of staff would be petrified to work at the university because I was there. And the vice chancellor became involved in all this. Could I just recap that the, the think piece you had written, yeah. your main thrust of it was this was a very good example of Judith Butler's concept, which is all gender is performative. And he was performing woman. Therefore, society was accepting he was a woman because performance is everything. And you mm. thought, oh, mm. isn't this interesting? This is Judith Butler coming to life. Is that it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I did. I, ha- I did a little bit of research. And I realised something that I hadn't realised before, that I wasn't allowed then to call Bruce Jenner a man even when he'd been fathering ch- children or was an Olympic athlete. I, 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 I learned that that was dead naming and that that was offensive and um, annihilating Caitlyn Jenner. So I, 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 I didn't put it as strongly as I've put it now. I was exploring some of these issues and it really came back at me. So for, so for a couple of days, I was petrified that I'd done something very, very wrong. I mean, I'd never had a, an experience like that before. And for the vice chancellor to get involved, I thought, God, I'm going to lose my job over something. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand where any of this was coming from. I literally had nothing to base any of this on. And I was then getting... Um, you know, it was fine. They put the they the lawyer said I hadn't broken any law. <laughs> it was it was put back up. Then I onto the website, and then I realised something that you know, some trans identifying academics felt the absolute right and confidence to write to my university, basically asking for me to be given the sack. Where had that confidence come from? Where, I, I simply didn't understand that. Also, then people wrote to me and told me how brave I was. And I was thinking, I wasn't brave. I just, I, I, I literally was innocently walked into that, which made me realise that there'd been a whole load of self-censoring and silencing that had gone on, which somehow I had missed all of that. I had not been aware. Yeah, it's almost like in 20 years, we can't even envisage what would be considered like outrageous that you could, you could bring up a point and it would be like, woo, woo. <laughs> because it was like you would step mm. out and then you went back in with all your knowledge, with your PhD, with your training, and you're a very educated woman. And you, you were told, oh my God, what you said is outrageous. And it wouldn't have been outrageous at all. 10 years previously, and probably won't be outrageous, I would argue, in 10 years. Mm. The thing that frightened me, it was, it, was, it was not just what I wrote, it was what I was allowed to think. That really, really shocked me. And I feel quite privileged now, actually, that I have had that experience. Because we all know, theoretically, that there are some societies in which you're not allowed to think certain things, but they feel very far away feels as if it's got nothing to do with us. The shock that I got was the realisation that in our liberal democracy, there are certain things that we cannot think and cannot say. And if we do, we have to do it privately, secretively. We find little groups in which to do it. And I thought, this is, this is shocking. I've 
thought that I was living in a liberal democracy. And now I realize that there are some very authoritarian um, dynamics in this society that I hadn't been aware of. It was almost as if I'd gone, like in the Narnia story, I'd gone into the wardrobe and I'd gone through the fur coats and I'd got to the, gone into another country, which was just, you know, the back of a wardrobe <laughs> um, distance. But it was... It exposed a whole world. Didn't it continue on? Because then, as far as I it know, you, yeah, you tell me. Yeah, there, there was a few more things happened then. Well, what actually happened was I, I, I talked about this with some people that I felt that I could trust. And the, the thing that was said to me by feminists who had apparently been in the know, I hadn't been, said, I said, I've got to think, I, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to be told not to right and think about this i'm i'm i'll have to pursue this more and they say don't do it you will you will be dragged down by this you will you, it's a vortex you'll ne- you'll never get out of it you'll be dragged further and further into it and i thought huh what a ridiculous thing to say that was um, this can't possibly be true <laughs> this can't <laughs> But I I did have a period of a few months where I was thinking and reflecting. And then an incident happened, which, again, was was very um, significant. And that incident was in my own home at my kitchen table where I was sitting with a friend who wanted to talk to me about something. And she had I'd known her for years. We'd had our babies together and so on. And um, she told me that her daughter was now identifying as a boy. And clearly, I'd known this little baby when she was born. This little child was a female child. And the thing that really frightened me was that um, I hadn't got 13-year-olds at that point. That, that my friend told me that she was frightened actually frightened to not go along with her daughter's narrative because of the school system and social services. And I think that flipped something in me. I thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. I have to, I'm compelled now to talk about something, to talk about this, to, to, to write about it, to think about it to engage other people in discussion about this because something really serious is going on. That, that in fact, what what we're doing now, at every other stage, we know that a 13-year-old is going through particular identities, developmental stages, that none of us want to be tied to what we thought when we were 13, and yet we're giving these young people such power and the authorities are investing these children with such power and going along with it. They, in fact, the parents are being infantilized and the children, and controlled and disciplined, and the children are being given this power. So, again, a whole constellation of things joined together, the dots joined together for me. It's amazing. It's and like I had the to children, speak out. The, the parents are being infantilized and the children are being adultified. And it's, 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 it's a horrible mm. kind of reverse... But am I right in thinking this was very much your bailiwick, that you were all about, uh, like when you were, you're, you, as an academic, your emphasis has been medicine and culture and ethics or something like that, that has been your emphasis. So this was exactly your yeah, yeah. field. Absolutely. Completely. And you went on to edit two books. I mean, you, you've written and edited more than this, but two books specifically about this question of transgender children and how uh, they're brilliant books, and we'll include them in the show notes, but these are books written about how the culture and the medical industry kind of interact. And I, I'm really curious to hear your, your response to this, but... Um, Stella and I have been discussing the way in which you take a culture-bound syndrome, like this explosion of trans identification in youth, and you pile on top of that a kind of critical social justice perspective that you must never question the identity of a marginalized person. Mm -hmm. And then you have a real recipe for exactly what your friend was describing, which is a terror to speak Mm 
basic truths and to orient the parent-child relationship in an appropriate way, which is kind of unheard of. I've never seen anything else like this, where a parent yeah. is afraid to parent their child. So can, can you talk a little bit about, of course, this conversation at your table sparked a big curiosity in you about what's going on, and you launched into working around this issue. Can you talk a little bit more about where things went next for you? So, of course, the next thing that I needed to do was to, as an academic, was to go to the Gender Identity Development Services at the Tavistock. I don't mean go literally to it, to start reading about it, to think about it. And further shock upon further shock was that the Gender Identity Development Service, as we call it, the JIDS for short in the UK, um, that the JIDS were, were... performing exactly the kind of phenomenon that you've just talked about, Sasha. They were mobilizing it. They were reproducing it. And not only that, that they, they, so, that they had literally moved from a clinical model to a social justice model and justified that, justified giving children puberty blockers on the basis of this social justice movement model which had come from, which was underpinned by queer theory. And again, I, I thought, how has that happened? And I can, and there's a trajectory within that. I can delineate that for you. But the fact that it had actually happened, like many of the shocks that I was getting, was just a further shock. Um, we need to talk about the Moral Maze interview as well. <laughs> I must remember to talk about that. But before you tell me about the Moral Maze, mm-hmm. I'd love to hear you delineate how the Gender Identity Clinic, which is a, in a hospital, the biggest uh, ide- gender clinic in, in England, in mm-hmm. the UK, how did they move from a medical model to a social justice model? How did that happen? <laughs> Well, in 1989, when the JIDS first came into existence, it wasn't under the auspices of the National Health Service at that time. It was it was within um, the Tavistock uh, Hospital, which wasn't a National Health Service hospital at that time. Um, it was started in 1989 by someone who decided that uh, what we needed to do was not pathologize children who identified as the other sex, but affirm them. So, again, you have to understand that the JIDs emerged at the very same time that queer theory was emerging. And emerged oh, at the time... I didn't realize Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and, and it, it was within the context that we're far too judgmental about people, we've pathologized homosexuality, what we need to do is depathologize everything and affirm people's diverse sexualities and genders and that's how it this started. is gender identity theory that they thought the gender is within you this is their belief this is reality this is the new kind of truth and now go with it yes but but again it didn't start with this idea that gender identity was inherent it started with this idea which we could probably agree with and go along with that what actually when children um, at this point, it was usually boys. When boys experiment with what it feels like to be um, a girl, perhaps by wearing girls' clothes or something, um, that that we shouldn't we shouldn't say that there's something inherently problematical with that. We should think it'd be much more um, humane and probably accurate to think of that child as just going through a period at which he's wanting to experiment with different forms of identity as he's growing up. So it started off as a good thing. I mean, I didn't make judgments about which, um, I don't want to use gender. Um, I, I encouraged my children to experiment with what it felt like to be the other sex because it seemed to be more freeing. So I think that that's what he was attempting to do, the director at the time. Now, this again has changed. And the, uh, the trajectory of that is, 
Um, you have to bring mermaids into this. So mermaids in the UK um, is a is a trans uh, lobby group for children, and and gyras another one, and these were parent led. It would take me hours to go into all of that. The basic point that I'm trying to make is that these lobby groups became very involved very quickly. And the JIDS was pulled in a direction at which also patient rights were being established. So the authority of the doctor was being um, not undermined, but problematized but with, in relation to um, patient rights. So a, a, a whole sort of perfect storm arose in which the JIDS became pulled in the direction of political activism with the, fee, with the policy of affirmation. And then the rest is history, as it were. Then we actually got to the point at which um, gendered intelligence is very important here as, as a trans lobby group because gendered intelligence, more than mermaids, which was basically just a par parent-led um, group, gendered intelligence is completely underpinned by queer theory. And the, what actually happened was that an argument was made that those therapists who work at the JID should be, um, because, because, of, because of out of social justice, the psychologists should perhaps be queer identified or trans identified, became more and more and more and more and more and more to do with uh, trans rights, um, only trans people can ex have the right to speak about these things. Trans people should be the trainers of the psychologists. And the world, you know, WPATH um, needed to... Uh, and this brave new world arrived. Could I just come in on this? So from what my understanding of this is, really in 1989, you know, the director came in and JIDS was established. And, it, you know, it sounded like quite a, a kind of a, a bright and noble idea of allow people, don't pathologize the wish to explore other genders, let them revel in it, let them celebrate it. But in the meantime, queer theory was kind of becoming more and more um, moving through the ranks into society from academia. And then in and around this, as you said, the doctor's rights were kind of being undermined and parents' rights, I do know uh, my, from my own work, parents' rights were also being undermined and it, it was kind of going more and more, listen to the child, listen to the child. And if the child says it, it is it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a kind of a, a there's an underpinning, I would argue, of gender identity if, is as in if you if you feel that there's a gender within you, you are that gender. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, this it's an extraordinary perfect storm came that if a four-year-old says they're a boy and they were born a girl, they are a boy and we should immediately run to that and support it in every which way we can, including medical, when they get older. And you're saying there was quite a few groups that maybe some of the listeners won't have heard of, but were really pushing kind of queer theory and a kind of a, a these are all theories and beliefs. Yeah. Just like religions, they're, 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 they come, come from great places and some of them might be true, but nobody has the keys to this kingdom. These are theories and beliefs that are underpinning it. But you told us not to forget about Mara May. So tell us, because I, I know I found this story fascinating before. So um, after the first book, I was invited onto um, a radio program in the UK. It's called The Moral Maze, and it's allegedly a sort of quite high profile, slightly intellectual program at which um, different sides of, of, a, of, of a particular issue are discussed. And, and there are some panelists there who who hear what witnesses have to say. So there were four, there were four people talking about transgenderism. And, um, uh, and, uh, and then the panelists afterwards decide whether they were persuaded, who they were most persuaded by. So I said um, that, um, just what I've said to you, that I think that children should be allowed to um, experiment and be whoever they want to be, 
thank goodness um, we allow them to do that more in society, I hope we do, but that they weren't inherently transgender and that we shouldn't medicalize children. But what adults do when the, what, you know, if, if adults want to have surgery and hormones, um, that's up to them. But we should protect children from that because children go through developmental stages and they have particular identities at particular times. It seemed to me that that was quite an orthodox thing to say. I didn't think in any way that that was outrageous. Apparently, that was so outrageous that I got dismissed. I was, I was, a, I was, um, I was in a political party at that time, and um, I was a, an elected spokeswoman in the Women's Equality Party, and that position was taken off me from having said such uh, outrageous things. But the thing that was very disturbing was that the panel the lit, uh, on the moral maze thought that I was disagreed with me completely. So I was sitting, uh, uh, the, uh, the opposing person was um, a man, Jane Fay, who had transitioned in late middle age, I was a father, and now identifies as a woman, and argued that there was nothing wrong with giving children puberty blockers, um, and that there was no more danger in giving puberty blockers than giving, putting a young teenage girl on the pill. So the idea, his, his argument, was that estrogen and testosterone are equi equivalent to the body, basically. It's a, it's, a, it's a hormone, an external hormone that we're, we're putting into the child's body. This was not questioned. I mean, that is the outrageous thing to have said. But the panelists went, were in support of him, and they saw me as being an extremist. So it, it was just another shock at how everything in this debacle is turned upside down. What uh, common sense or ethics become um, hatred and bigotry and extremism. And, you know, once I'd gone through these various uh, experiences, um, it, it hasn't, it should have put me off. You know, friends and families, families say, stop. Um, you don't have to be doing this anymore. But the more I do it, the more I realize it needs to be done. Somebody needs to, somebody needs to be critiquing this until, until it's exposed as an absolute fabrication. So I don't, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a transgender child. I think that's the transgender child is a fabrication. I mean, people are, the, the idea that we're assigned a sex is utterly ludicrous I mean, it just defies all rationality and biological fact. Um, and I, more than many people I know, I believe in gender fluidity and not restricting people according to however they want to identify or present themselves. So we have a, we have a theory now, a transgender ideology, it, which biology is supposed to be a social construct, but gender identity is inherent. And all it does is, it's a very traditional orthodox view well, it, that has been imported in the guise of gender fluidity. So that the idea that masculinity is fixed and femininity is fixed, all that's different now is that you can have a boy's body be truly female inside and vice versa. And nobody explains what being truly female or truly male is. But because this oppressed, allegedly oppressed group say it, who are going to commit suicide at any second if you don't just go along with it, um, because they say that they have an experience of an inherent gender identity, we have to believe it. Well, I, I don't mind if people have an experience of an inherent gender identity. They're allowed to have that experience it just can't be imposed as an overall thesis for everybody else on how we live our lives and the kinds of laws that we have and the kinds of things that we tell our children. Uh, I want to ask 
Heather, you know, I think some of this can seem so theoretical and abstracted, but mm-hmm. the, the issue that I see is that when, when it comes down to the wire, this theory of hormones just being, you know, completely selectable, like you're just some neutral vessel and you can just pump yourself full of whichever hormones you choose, there are mm. real manifested uh, consequences to that because our biologies are a very real thing and it may take some time for the ramifications of this to show up in culture. But I wonder as we wrap up, with your knowledge of medicine and its interaction with culture, Mm. what are your predictions about how all of this is going to unravel? What do you think will happen if you could summarize based on your knowledge of medicine and culture? Mm. I, that's a really good question. My prediction is that it will, in a few years' time, this will just disappear and we will look back at this and wonder how it could possibly have happened. So, for example, if we look back into medical history, we'll see that the kinds of medical figures that were created, for example, the hysterical woman, the pathological homosexual, we look back and think, whoa, those, those, those people were so strange to, to, to believe that, to believe in the, that those were concrete, empirically existing figures outside of discourse, as it were. And I think we'll do exactly the same as this. We think now the trans lobby, and I haven't really mentioned that this, there's a very powerful trans lobby and lots of money behind this, by the way, including Big Pharma. But I think that we look back and think, um, you know, those people went along with this idea that there truly are transgender children rather than that we've created this idea of the transgender child. And, of course, our children fit in to the category. Of course they do, because it's all that they hear. Um, So the important thing is to say there isn't such a thing as a transgender child. Um, There's just a, there are just children who are at various degrees of confusion, experimentation, and all they can do is take on the narratives that the adults are actually giving them, including medicine. So, um, I hope that this alleged figure of the true transgender child will see the way of all the true figures that we've rejected in the past as being actually um, problematical, um, unethical, and so on. Just as medicine is littered with practices that we're embarrassed to think about now, that we did in all good faith. So I'm not suggesting that the people who work at the JIDs are, you know, have horns on their heads and are wanting to be horrid to children. I'm sure that many of the practitioners utterly believe in what they're doing. And this is where the problem lies, that we have now a a medical profession. Not all doctors, of course, there are many doctors who are critical of it, but I'm talking about the JIDs here. Um, has now got an ethos at which it feels so convinced of its own practices that even though in the UK we've had a judicial review which says that children should not be allowed, um, uh, can't, don't have the capacity to consent to puberty blockers, you know, it is going to the Court of Appeal to, to, to try and get that judgment rescinded because it's utterly convinced the jits, that it's on a moral pathway. So we have to... uh, The point is that in not talking about it, none of these things can be publicly discussed. We have to find a way of talking about this without being polarised as being on the right side of history or the wrong side of history, or if you're critical, as I am, of transgender and children, that this means that I must want to restrict children. It's so the opposite. <laughs> um, it's so frustrating for me. But anyway. I, I think we did something today, though. I, I think we, we've hopefully really penetrated this and certainly got people talk, talking. 
you know, nobody can wipe you out as as some sort of religious zealot who wants to, you know what I mean? Anybody who kind of has listened to this podcast will realize that you really know your stuff and that what you're looking for is a more expansive view as opposed to the more kind of confining view. But thanks a million. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 